Hey, so we are going to continue on with the monospace project. And what am I going to try to cover today? Basically, I'll mention where I'm at. And I'll try to determine where I'm at. <laughs> so um, at a high level, there is all right, let me say this better. I'll mention where we're at scope wise, what we've completed, and what we have to do. And then I'll kind of focus on very basic proofing techniques in this video to kind of show you how I determine what to work on next in a project. Or if I'm looking at a font, how do you evaluate quality of that font and things that could be improved about it? So yeah, getting to it, here is our name mono black italic. And here is the name mono black upright. We have capitals and lowercase, and they are mostly compatible. There might be a few that aren't. Um, we'll find that out by exporting to medium and bold and also kind of running those through a basic proofing process. Uh, and yeah, I did this relatively fast. I was kind of updating the spacing as I went, but I'm sure that the spacing can be further improved. I know that I have to work on numerals and some punctuation, and I'm going to deliberately not work on like a lot of this font just yet. Uh, there's, if we look at the font as a whole, um, there's lots of accents and things like fractions and arrows and all sorts of symbols that are useful in name sans. Um, but my very first use of this monospace is as some basic kind of navigational text on my upcoming website. So I really just needed to have a solid uh, base character set for basically English only. Um, I may go through and fix some of the accents. A lot of them seem to be okay because I've also been moving around the anchor points uh, or trying to do a decent job of that. Um, but yeah, there's just things here that I know aren't there yet. Uh, yeah, so let's kind of make a document, by the way. Uh, we know, well, there's a better way to do this. Uh, numbers, please. Let me create a very basic um, spacing string. So... Let's see, what am I doing with this numeral string? Basically, I'm comparing it to the uppercase control characters and then lowercase control characters, ones, and, not lowercase, numeral control characters, ones and zeros. Um, yeah, I'm sort of curious whether that is the best control characters to use in a monospace font. Uh, this may make a little more sense where the one has no bottom serif, like in a sans uh, font course. Um, but I think it is probably what I'll want. And then um, let's also create a control character spacing setup for our basic punctuation. Uh, we'll do like these, um, my quotes, and I'll probably Yeah. It's yeah, it's hard because I like want to keep things deliberately fairly focused, but also I don't want to skip really obvious easy things. So yeah, it's a bit of uh you know, to be determined what exactly I'll try to include here. But yeah, this seems like a good start. Um, right. And I guess I meant to say that we have upper and lower case in regular black and 
italic and black italic, and then we do not really have it in uh, the thin style. You can see, like, say, the W hasn't yet been changed, the M hasn't been changed. Some things have been, like the I and L and R. So it's kind of, you know, maybe partially there. Uh, the italic really hasn't been changed at all. And in fact, you can see a couple of instances where I just copied the regular italic into that space um, to basically fix later. But the nice thing is um, I don't need to finish these to get usable and proofable uh, exports for styles I know that I want to use right away. Um, so in fact, like before this whole series on YouTube of working on this font, I had spent time a couple of weeks sort of uh, off and on drawing the regular and italic and using those in my code editor to get a basic sense of what kind of shapes and styles I wanted for these characters. And so that helped me come to some slightly foundational but maybe surprising decisions like the fact that, um, for instance, this form of the G, which I had in a sketchbook and I thought looked nice, felt a little too weird in use. Uh, so that's why I went to this one. And then also like in italics, I ended up really preferring this sort of simplified R and this I and L are not really things I'm used to seeing, but things I ended up liking. Yeah, so that's part of the process, which I'll try to maybe show some of that just by using my code editor in a very basic way to edit some spacing strings. So, right, let's let's kind of get into it here. Um, first of all, I have my glyphs font set up with the masters or sources and exports right now the thin exports are not active um, and then regular to black r regular medium bold black ultimately there will be a semi bold and an extra bold also inserted in here but i don't really need those just yet so i'm not going to include them um, something else really worth mentioning that i did was Previously, I had set these weight numbers to just kind of align to um, basic uh, like CSS weight numbers. So black was 900, regular was 400, um, bold was 700. But you can see that I'm no longer doing that. What I'm now doing is mapping them to my desired uh, thickness of the lowercase n stem. So that is to say that my regular has a stem of 181. Let's double check that that's the case. Um, this is easier. And uh, yeah, so 176, let's see. That's interesting. <laughs> so I guess it's slightly different. That's pretty funny. Um, it's pretty close. So what I had done to get there, by the way, was opening, let's see if I can open some of these, the uh, like name sans text fonts. Um, and these are a slightly lower optical size. These are like optical size eight, whereas the font I'm making for mono is optical size 12. Um, so yeah, so I got these measurements from here, for instance, 181. Um, or let's open the bold. Three hundred. Right. So yeah, I took these numbers from name sans text. And it doesn't actually I may I may adjust this a little bit, but the main thing is that these relationships are 
going to be really close to what I need to um, export a bold that is the kind of relationship from regular to black that I want. So I don't know if that makes sense at all. Um, this is the kind of thing that sort of just requires some experimentation and thinking, but um, basically as long as you have the right relationship in your axis coordinates for weight, it kind of works out. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you're still giving things the correct weight class um, so that like CSS in the end does know it, if you're using these instances, what's what, CSS and other apps. Um, and ultimately, you know, before I release this font to the public and have other people use it, I will go back and make another pass. Um, I'll set up like a more formal build system with font make and probably design spaces. So um, I can really check that these things are doing what I want them to do. Um, and in fact, in today's video, I may do a quick font bakery process to at least see if there are any major red flags in these fonts that I should know about before publishing them on my website. Um, I don't need these fonts to be like absolutely perfect. Um, you know, they don't need to work on every possible platform and app. Um, not that any font really can, but they don't need to work for everyone. They just need to work for my use case. And if you have a single use case, it's certainly a lot simpler to have a pretty good um, expectation of quality and what you need to do to meet that. Okay, so let me update the font name to today's date. Uh, it is currently the 14th. Um, and when I'm working in glyphs, especially in the early time of a font, I like to update the family name to have a date stamp. Um, and if I make multiple families within a day, I'll start appending like A, B, C to those family names. And that's just, um, it's maybe slightly overkill, but it's a way to ensure that um, I know if a font has properly installed on my computer and then I'm getting it from the font menu. And if you leave it as the same name, especially early on when you're making so many revisions, um, it's really easy to get into this space where you're like, you're not sure if it's actually updated uh, and you may have to like restart your computer or do like font clearing steps and such. Um, and if you need to do that, you need to do that, but it's not super fun. Um, and I, it's much simpler just to have that font name change. Um, if you do run into font uh, um, font cache issues, this is a really great article on how you can clear them out with uh, code on the terminal. And there's various different styles, um, but Dr. Ken Lindy is a real expert here, and this is a great blog post if you do need to like clear out your Mac font cache. Um, I'm sure things are a little different on the PC uh, for sure. So now that we've updated these font names and I've discussed why I do it the way I do it, um, I'm going to export some TTFs and uh, yeah, so We'll just do it in the um, font projects fonts folder for now uh, and see what we get. Let's just go for it. So it's warning us that some glyphs are not compatible. Um, the main issues that I'll probably fix in this current session are like the ampersand and some of these like braces and brackets. Um, these uh, accent marks, I don't think I'll fix just yet. So um, I will definitely fix those before sharing the font uh, or like, you know, selling licenses to it. Uh, but, you know, first things first. Um, so let's check out our font. Right, so we want to 
look at the fonts folder where I exported to. Here are the fonts I just exported. And then for comparison, actually, I saved a couple of the uh, one from a few days ago, um, just to kind of look at how those compare before and after weight matching. Um, so we have regular and bold here, and we can grab regular and bold here. Regular is going to be the same, uh, because in either case, I had matched the glyphs export instance to the same exact weight value as the master or source of the regular. Um, so either way, that's going to be smack dab on our outlines. Uh, but the bold is interpolated and its value has been shifted. So, um, well, first of all, you can see the colon is a little messed up here, but it is subtly thicker uh, here. And uh, it's like to the extent that you don't necessarily notice it here, but if you've got enough text um, at actual text size, it does sort of become apparent, especially if it's nearby named Sans, that this is a little lighter. Um, so just to prove that I'm not uh, making that up, um, because sometimes you might see something that you expect to see, even if it's not uh, necessarily true. So uh, it's good to double check these things. Um, so here is the one from right now. That is 296, which is close to what I wanted it to be, which is nice. Um, that is to say, I entered the export value in at 300 based on measurements from name sans text, but that's a smaller optical size, so that is a little thicker. Um, 274. So that is pretty darn subtle. To be honest, less of a difference than I expected even. Um, I suppose, well, this probably isn't a rigorous test. That is interesting. So I don't know. I, yeah, I would have guessed that it would have been a slightly bigger difference than just two units per stem. Uh, it does kind of feel like more difference than that, honestly. Um, but maybe, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's what two units per stem looks like as a difference, which that that's a surprise uh, because, yeah. So I think there's a little bit of both. I think I'm actually seeing some difference, but I think also my knowledge that there should be a difference and there is a difference is perhaps tricking me into thinking that there's more of a difference than maybe a passerby would notice. Uh, still though, I want it to be, you know, as close to the actual name sans bold at optical size 12 as possible. So it is better this way. Um, and yeah, I'm, I may refine it further as I go. Okay. Um, so one thing we can do is, okay, so, I mentioned earlier, we will use our exports to determine what is compatible and what is not. If you are a Glyphs user, you might have thought, well, there's this tab here called incompatible uh, masters. And that is indeed a useful tab if you just have, uh, you know, if you're kind of far along in a font or further along in a font and uh, you don't want any incompatible glyphs in there, you can go to this and it automatically gets them. But it's kind of wrong in our case at the moment because uh, we have this thin style that we're not actually exporting yet. And of course those uh, have some incompatible drawings between glyphs because we haven't fixed these yet. Um, so it's actually a lot more useful to me to actually export a bold and then pop it open in glyphs and kind of view what glyphs have been made and which have not been made. So for instance, let's look at our basic Latin. Okay, that's all there. Uh, we'll actually repeat this for 
the bold italic as well. And um, yeah, so we've got our basic Latin, basic English really there, which is nice. We can view just decimal digits for now. Those appear to have interpolated. Um, that doesn't mean they're good. It just means that they're kind of point compatible. Um, and then we've got punctuation. And this is where some real stuff shows up that is not point compatible and hasn't been adjusted yet. Uh, in particular, I want things to be wider. So that's a real table stakes look at what we have to fix. Um, let's try to be a little more uh, productive, I guess, or like a little more fine grained in how we um, kind of look at what to fix. So uh, there's an app called Font Proofer um, that I really appreciate. It's made by Peter Noel. And uh, if you haven't heard of it, you should check it out, fontproofer.com. It is a really neat way to like make proofs, which are such an essential part of the type design process, but uh, kind of mysterious because it's not something that's baked into like Glyphs Editor or anything. And it's kind of a thing where foundries build up proofing strategies over time, um, but don't necessarily always publish those strategies. Uh, and some of it is because it's not so much the, I mean, I think that foundries do have word lists that they've developed to check their fonts at a basic high level. But I think that also a useful aspect of proofing is starting to grow your ability to like have a question and then create a proof to investigate that question. So uh, I think one of my previous videos was about proofing the, I think, question down and question mark kerning in name sans uh, and like the T kerning. And you can see that I made specific proofs to proof just strings of that kind of thing, where you maybe do a proof of quotes against the lowercase or something. Uh, but yeah, let's just kind of create a new proof and see what we can do. Uh, so one thing that font proofer does that Honestly, I usually run it from font files that are actually built um, because I've mostly used font proofer on fonts that are a little further along. Uh, so I will be exploring this slightly as a newcomer. I mean, I've tried this, I've dabbled with it. Um, it's like Glyph's connection here, but it'll be fun to look at it in a better way. So let's check out, um, let's just try it directly. This is really cool. So it shows us all of the uh, masters and then all of the exports. So I want to do bold. And I wonder if I can do bold italic as well. Yes. Yeah, it's really thoughtfully designed. I, it is maybe in comparison to other font tools out there, it's a bit spendy. It's a subscription, but um, it, yeah, it, it makes a hard and important part of the process a lot easier. So uh, I think it's, and it's really well made. Okay, so one thing I like that it does is like a glyph grid and you have to leave the content blank to show all the glyphs. Um, and this will be kind of funny because um, you can see that a lot of our glyphs aren't working yet. But this is a typical uh, grid we have, or that I like to do in most um, proofs. And uh, trying to uh, make sure I know where it's going to export. Okay, let's choose a folder. We'll just call it proofs for now. I'll sort this better later. 
Uh, but let's export a couple of PDFs. Um, it's pretty fast, wow. So it already um, generated that. And did it generate the italic version? Let's see. Maybe I have to make sure that that's actually an option posted. Uh, Uh, I have to export a PDF for each active font style. Okay, so now it'll give me both. So let's try this again. And nice. So it popped it open over here. We'll just delete the first one. Take modified, yeah. Uh, even though it's the same, whatever. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty cool because it will show me, uh, yeah, just a grid of glyphs, which is so useful, especially uh, a little later on in the font design process when I'm looking for interpolation errors. One thing I like to do, you know, because if you like mess up one point as you're like tweaking something, um, maybe if a glyph will export, but might have like a flipped around uh, outline or something, and I don't want to release that, uh, to people. So one sanity check I do basically is to flip through the intermediate styles as glyph grids. And that just helps me quickly eyeball, uh, to check that nothing is broken. Um, yeah, the glyph grid is not the most useful on a font that I know is still changing a lot. So you see lots of problems that are issues just because I haven't fixed these things yet. So um, cool feature, but not necessarily the most important thing. Um, maybe, by the way, I should save this so that we, um, oh, it's just Command S actually. Um, what do we call this name? Mono uh, 2023 09. 14. So it's got this proofing format, which is pretty nice. Um, so I'm going to uncheck this and let's, let's make like, I'll try to go through and make a basic proof that I would kind of hope to receive from somebody if I wanted to give them feedback on a font. So, um, basic characters. Um, basically you got your ABCs and your one, two, threes. Uh, can I copy glyph names space separated? How does that look? Cool. And then I think I might have to actually open these, go into text mode and copy them. Nice. And let's hit a return here. Okay. And uh, I'll make them a lot bigger because I like these to be kind of nice and large. Um, yeah, let's just export and see where we're at. Okay, that looks pretty decent. I could bump it up a little further even. Basically, I want these to be as large as possible to fit on a single page so that I can uh, actually like draw suggested adjustments with a pen if uh, as necessary. I'm going to go a little bigger. Oh, that. And usually I would maybe do like centering or something um, and approach this slightly differently. Because this is a mono space, it actually looks really nice <laughs> just like this. Um, so I'm going to kind of roll with what's working. Oh, shoot. Uh, slightly too big. So I could remove the spaces, but let's just 
bump it down. This is thrilling content, I am sure. Hey, all right. So there, there's a good looking page one of a proof. Um, and yeah, they're plenty big, so I can write with a red pen or whatnot, uh, suggested changes or things that I feel like I haven't gotten to yet. Um, and ultimately, this isn't always, this is like a good page to use to record thoughts and suggestions and maybe think about the overall design of characters, but not necessarily the best for actually determining how a font is working. Um, so let's close all of our preview windows and add our next section. I have this uh, GitHub repo that's open and it's just called arrow type slash spacing. And it's just a variety, a little collection of like useful things to use for spacing. Um, so yeah, kind of when I come across something and I think, oh, that's a good general purpose spacing proofing tool, I'll try to add it to here. Um, another really good um, resource for making a proof is when I consult sometimes, Ono type um, proofing is a great blog post. And here James suggests like various things that are useful to think of in a proof. So right, big character set, punctuation, that's a good idea I should add. Um, paragraphs and headlines, spacing strings. Yeah, permutations kind of some personality. Those are good pieces of advice. Um, so one thing is the like basic standard proofing. So let's do that. Yeah, 16 points is probably a good size there. And you'll recognize this pretty much from what I've been using in glyphs to do basic design passes. Um, this is also a really good blog post from Heffler and Co text for proofing fonts. And uh, this is a really good blog post about their approach to it. What I'm going to do is grab the lowercase and uppercase and uh, go ahead and use that. And before I add them here, before I add them here, I'm going to quickly um, paste them in here and do some changes. By the way, oops. What is our font called? Let's, uh, Use the latest name mono, uh, name mono. I popped it in my folder. Does that work? Oh, sort of, but there's clearly something weird with the, uh, um, metadata of the font because our black is showing up as the regular, um, which doesn't make any sense. Um, but I've probably just forgotten to do something. Oops, all right, I don't want the bold italic. I'm just checking this while it's fresh in my mind. Okay, I left it at a weight class of regular, so that'll do it. That's why it's important to select these, that bold, medium, regular. Cool. So yeah, probably it had the weight class of regular and it had an earlier name. So I'm guessing that those two things caused it to uh, be a problem. So let's add this to there and uh, Add that to there, export again. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so we've got these. I'll just toss them in my fonts folder quickly and see if that updates in VS Code. It may or may not, but fingers crossed. It did, okay, cool. That's an example of why it's kind of nice to give something a different timestamped family name, um, just because you can more quickly like change it and see that it changed. So, and even go back and forth. This is a bit of a silly example, but maybe a, if I was changing, say like a lowercase g and I wanted to see the effect of a small change, that's kind of a useful way to do it. Um, so back to our actual track of proofing. Um, we have this Heffler text for proofing fonts, but the most useful thing I've seen is that, uh, well, I'll do it and then I'll explain it. So I'm gonna select uh, period space and then command shift L to select all instances of that. And then hit return to add a line break for everything. This is great for this text because this text is smartly sorted letter by letter. Um, so the A line has a bunch of uh, words with A in them in different scenarios. So like A surrounded by curves, A surrounded by straights, a word that begins with A, uh, two A's in a row, that sort of thing. And it, it's for each letter A to Z. So that's really nice. And just giving it line breaks between each of these um, makes it so much nicer because you can more easily find your spot. Uh, so let's do this. I'm gonna do like H, uh, and co uppercase. I usually make sure to turn on kerning, um, but that doesn't mean anything for, well, hopefully it, it, it doesn't mean anything for a monospace font, so I'm not gonna do that here. Um, let's also do h and co lowercase. Um, yeah. And then and again, let's find an instance of this period space, command shift L and return. So it tells us all of these. And here again, the letter that starts the sentence is the letter being tested in the sentence. So yeah, just adding a line break is really a helpful thing. All right, um, well, let's export our PDF and see what we have. I'll probably wanna tweak the sizing of things, for instance. Okay. Um, to control my sizes, by the way, I'm using an app I like called Divi. That's pretty nice. So this isn't bad. I think I'll actually turn down the size a little bit to 12 because this is really an optical size 12 font kind of. And yeah, I think for these spacing things in particular, that will make sense. Well, maybe the literal spacing I'll actually have a bit bigger than it needs to be. Maybe I'll do like 20. All right, let's just export again and see what we get. Okay, so 20 still fits on the page nicely. And it's big enough to maybe write some notes. I wonder. Can I control that? Yes, I can control the line height. So that's pretty nice. I'll do like one, two, five, and see if that um, gives us what we want. Cool. That's pretty nice because it just gives us that little bit of extra space to write between lines as you tend to need to do for like 
minuses and pluses to mark out things to change. And then here, okay, so command zero will give us kind of the one X size basically. Oh, I'm definitely gonna have to do some line heights in here. So let's add that here as well. I bet I should even do 1.5. Okay. Cool. So this is nice because it gives us a little bit of a better chance to look at these lines. And I wonder, possibly even putting it into columns would be a sensible idea. Um, maybe I'll do uh, 375. I think that's 3 eighths, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, and can I do this in columns? I think so, yes. So I actually just want this flows across columns. Yeah. And then I can duplicate this because I've set these things up. And I'll call this one my lowercase now. Do that and then delete this section. Okay. Wow, this tool's so nice. Really love it. Yes, you can use InDesign. You should use InDesign to an extent for sure. Um, but this kind of is pretty smart for covering many of the things you need to do for proofing and making it just so much faster uh, than setting up a document in InDesign. Um, cool. Why did it not go into columns? <laughs> I'm just like starting to think. Uh, maybe I'll try one more time to export the PDF. Huh. Um, maybe I have to do something like this. to get columns. I'm actually slightly confused. Oh, yes. Okay, so that worked. It was just slightly unintuitive, but not bad. Um, yeah, so to set up three columns, I just um, specified the font size three times. Um, and that did the trick. And I prefer to generate new documents with the timestamp and style named. Um, it does create a lot of PDFs. Um, obviously they're pretty easy to delete. So I just kind of go through and keep deleting them. Um, as I'm kind of figuring it out. And that way, at least, it's sort of like changing the font name. I just prefer to know that it's the new one. And then later, looking back, I obviously want time sheet or timestamps on things. And I don't want to, I especially don't want to replace a font proof I made like three months ago with a brand new font proof if I've been working on the font, because then I lose the ability to sort of visually compare what changed about them. Yeah, so honestly, this is plenty for now to sort of start evaluating our font. There's obviously more that we could do as well. Um, but yeah, like especially in terms of like permutations, and punctuation, I guess, is one thing that I should do. Um, 
do I already have a punctuation list here? I could pull it from another proof. Uh, yeah. I guess in terms of proofing this mono font, I should also proof some like different uh, code languages ultimately, you know, JavaScript, Python, etc. cetera. Um, and that would be really sensible for now. I'll just do something much more basic. I'll just start with like a, a permutation. So, oh yeah, I already already set that up here. And I think I'll simplify this text perhaps. I'll probably just I don't know whether to keep just the lowercase or just the uppercase. I will keep just the lowercase for now. And you can see that this is messed up, which is good. So let's add this. Um, let's give this columns as well. And see what that looks like. Oh, I should have increased the line height probably. Okay, we didn't really need to give it columns unless I make it significantly bigger. I should make it 20 points. And yeah, maybe just flow it into here. That would probably be more sensible. So. Here I'm going to shift uh, right so I can select a line break. It's invisible, but it's there. And then I'm going to select them all and then change it to a space. And I don't think I need these double things. That's more for pasting in glyphs, uh, the double slashes. Let me see what happens if I put them in there. Oh yeah, fits on the same page. So that's pretty cool. Um, I would kind of expect it to match our columns that we've already set up, but it probably means that, oh, I've got a slightly different uh, order here. Oh, that's a bit annoying. Um, uh, uh, I guess I add an extra no in the middle of these versus up here. So I'm going to select no, no, and change it to simply no, if that makes any sense. It's just uh, slightly more or less verbose way of getting at the same thing, trying to see how the spacing compares to the control characters. And I don't need this one anymore. Delete that section. OK. Cool. So these columns are lining up better. There's still issues where, for instance, this glyph didn't export. So it just chops it right out. And that kind of messes with our flow. What glyph is that? I'm curious suddenly. Um, let's wrap. Uh, so it's just the right brace. Yeah, that makes sense. It's probably uh, like a component in some of the sources and not all of them or something similar. Um, yeah, but this is a pretty good starter proof. Gives me lots to look at. Uh, to think through what could be better about this family. And by the way, um, I can add a few more fonts now that I've kind of designed the thing. Um, so let me kind of 
add regular and regular italic. And these are the four styles I care about for the moment. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, if you proof too many styles of anything, then uh, it's hard to look at any of it. So um, yeah. So it's hard to evaluate properly and actually find things to work on. Um, let me see if this will export one long PDF. I think so. No, okay, that's a slight quirk of font proofer for now. That's okay. I'll show you the recommended workaround here. Um, let me delete some proofs. Well, I can delete all the PDFs actually for a minute. So let me export a PDF. And then if you want to combine these, you can select them all and then right click and quick actions, create PDF and it creates one uh, kind of big PDF, which is pretty cool. Name, name mono, I'll call it ribeye, which stands for regular italic, bold, bold italic. Oh, and it opens up, I guess, in Acrobat by default. You can see that, uh, for instance, it went from regular italic to regular to bold italic to bold. And um, I suppose that just uh, is due to our sorting here, which is fair enough. Um, Oh, and it goes with the numbers. That's cool. Um, I bet it's also due to then the way I've sorted them here. So we can actually, this is kind of a new feature to font proofer, which is great. You have all sorts of options about how you're sorting the thing, but the default one actually sorts this in a pretty appealing way. So I'm just gonna go with that. Boom, we've got our exports. Let's combine it into a PDF. Name mono, ribeye. And let me open it in a preview. Cool. So yeah, here we have a proof. The other reason that I like starting each section with like the big alphabet essentially is that in like a sidebar of thumbnails, that's one very simple way to um, see each section. Sometimes I'll start a page just by saying like, um, I'll just say like font proof name mono and the date or something here. Um, well, I guess I'll just do that uh, section title. And I'll just make this real big. Um, Let's see what that looks like. Okay, <laughs> I made it too big. So I'm gonna do it half that size actually. Kind of looks good though. But uh, I do want it to fit on only one page. much nicer. So yeah, that just makes a slightly better section starter uh, than before. So I'm trying to close all my, okay. Um, so let me copy, nope, that's not what I wanted. Let me copy that and the latest exports are what I want. 
uh, quick actions, create PDF. Yes. Open that with preview. Cool. So there you have it. Slightly better uh, page, uh, section pages. Um, you know, maybe something I hope to see someday is like a variable kind of syntax so that I could throw in the uh, font style with each of these. The font style is listed here though, so it's not a huge deal. And by the way, I can also tell that this is regular and this is regular italic, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a pretty small gripe and there's other priorities. But yeah. Uh, what is next, I wonder? I mean, yeah, basically I will go through these and determine spacing things to take another look at. I would either print this out or put it on an iPad with the app Notability. And in Notability, you can use the Apple Pencil to kind of proof something out. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you could go about this. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have an iPad or even a printer, uh, though printing it out, getting it onto a device other than your computer screen is generally pretty helpful just so it puts your uh, head in a different space and allows you to really think about it. Um, yeah, obviously these are a total mess right now. So that is the next very obvious thing uh, to fix. And yeah, my numerals are a little too wide for this uh, monospace unit of space. Um, so that is something I know I need to fix. Um, but yeah, here's like a decent proof that uh, you could send to somebody and get them to take a look at and uh, give feedback on. And yeah, the proof that makes sense varies at each step of the way um, and varies based on what you're looking for and what questions you have. But um, yeah, helpful to think about different ways to proof things. Um, yeah, there's other other good proofing resources, and I have mentioned some of these in here, uh, like Idiot Proof comes to mind is a great proof making tool. Um, and yeah, if you know of other uh, other proofing tips or tools, um, or like if you have a certain way of making a proof, let me know in the comments below. Um, I am always trying to figure out better approaches, and it's something I feel like is an area where I can grow uh, further um, as a type designer. And yeah, something I want to develop over time. I haven't really like gone through like a sort of traditional type foundry that was like run by people, you know, more experienced than me. So I haven't really had that kind of experience as an employee to pick up lots of proofing techniques. Um, and yeah, so much of the time at a type design program, it's more like, you know, make some proofs and uh, you kind of have to figure out what to proof yourself, which is a useful thing. Um, yeah, looking at this, one thing I'm picking up on is the fact that I have a sort of different strategy for the descenders of F and J than for Y. This Y is more like the G in name sans um, and also this G, but I should probably try making it more like this. Um, or perhaps making these more like this. But I think for the mono, I'm, I'm trying to have like a different, more expressive take. Um, and I'm sort of embracing it being a complementary typeface rather than just a monospace version of name sans. So I kind of 
like the idea of there being sort of different ideas in here. Um, it's almost like the subway signs, like there's different variations of ideas depending which subway station you go to. Um, so I don't know. That's my current theory of it. I may change. Um, I may make the monospace italic boring or make maybe a like a boring stylistic set so that it's really close to name sans. I, yeah, I'm still thinking it through um, for sure. Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably quite a bit already for this video um but one other thing i could do that i think i will do is um running font bakery on a couple of these fonts just to see if there are major problems that i'm not aware of and just kind of to demo that that is another thing i would definitely do early on in a font to see things that are wrong that I didn't expect to be. So let's pop this open in our, I was editing some SVGs here, pop that open in a code editor like VS Code. And uh, I haven't actually even made a virtual environment in here yet, so I will do that. Um, I'm like, Okay, I'm on a slightly different keyboard than usual, so some of my shortcuts take me a second to think through. Um, right, uh, so we want a virtual environment, we want to install Font Bakery, and then we want to run Font Bakery. Um, I'll just, let me actually delete the ones I don't want anymore, and I'll run Font Bakery on this collection here. Maybe I'll make a folder for these. Oops, just so it doesn't clash with those. All right, so um, I do have uh, command line aliases, uh, sort of like short commands to do longer things. Um, but I'll try to use the non-alias way to do these things so that it makes sense to other people. Um, but if I mess up, that is why. So Python 3-m ven ven, that means use the ven module, which is virtual environment, to create a folder called venv in our current uh, location, which makes this folder. And then we can activate that virtual environment so that Anything we install goes here rather than up to our system level. Uh, so sort then then activate. And now our terminal tells us we're in there. Um, this is a recursive font, by the way. Recursive mono casual, I think. Um, I'm still using it in my terminal because it's got more glyphs than name mono so far. And I like them both, I guess. Uh, so then let's pip install um, font bakery. And pip will tell us it should be updated probably. We'll do that too. kind of forever telling us this. Okay, um, so now we can run Font Bakery. And sometimes I have to consult the guides, but let's see if I can remember this. Font Bakery is the program. First of all, let's say clear so it's a little easier to read. Uh, Font Bakery is the program. The sub command that we're trying to run is check universal because that's a suite of checks we want to run. And then I think I just have to give it a path. I'll put it in quotes. Uh, if I had any spaces in these paths, that would be really important. 
Um, and I guess we probably want to output to Markdown so that it's easier to consult. Um, we'll call this checks. And let's see if I'm remembering this. Um, ah, messed it up slightly. Uh, oh, I probably have to, I wonder, can I just give an asterisk or do I have to give it a list? Okay. Ah, uh, it's GitHub Markdown. Okay, that seems to be working now. We'll know in a minute. It's running a suite of tests, and it does also tell us the results of these tests up here. Um, there will be kind of a lot of noise at this point because we already know that we have a lot of things that aren't compatible or other pro such problems, but let's see. So we'll open the preview. Let's close these guys for a second. Um, okay, it always shouts at you for this, but I sort of, I don't know. I see why it's there, but sometimes I think that different stro stroke thicknesses are useful on underline. Um, Uh, yeah, I haven't really thought about my uh, vertical metrics at all yet. Um, although it's coming from name mono, so I, I, I have thought these through. So uh, I think it's just that I disagree with those. Um, oh. I'm surprised this is maybe it installed for my cache. Okay, honestly, nothing. Oh, this, certainly before I uh, publish this, this is probably the very most important thing Font Baker is telling us. There's certain th pieces of data you want in a monospace font so that programs recognize it as a monospace font. So um, these are all the areas where we wanna make sure that we have the correct values. Um, otherwise, various apps will maybe not put this in the font menu uh, if they expect monospace fonts only, etc. things like that. Um, same, yeah, these are kind of the same thing. Um, some of these glyph names will also potentially have to think through. Ah, this is slightly wrong, so I'll want to go fix that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I won't fix all of these on the video, but there's a quick look at how Font Bakery is useful. Um, some of it, using Font Bakery is kind of learning which checks are most important um, to pay attention to. Uh, and yeah. Things like this can be especially important where they're telling you very specific pieces of data that you should go fix. So I will be fixing that. Um, yeah, honestly, this video has gone pretty long already, I'd say. So I'll leave it at that and um, maybe record this fixing as a separate video. Um, but yeah, I think it's kind of can feel mysterious how to like once you draw a font how to check that whether it's good or bad or what to fix um and those are two basic strategies that are really useful making proofs just to like put things into different combinations using good test text and using font bakery to run checks on your fonts that's all very useful stuff um to do and yeah, the other aspect of it is just using it a lot. So um, 
yeah seeing it written out in code like this is so useful for a monospace font um, so that I can really kind of evaluate what's working and which what's not working. Um, yeah. Like how does it feel to actually read it? That's, that's kind of what matters in a monospace uh, font. So, I mean, aesthetics matter as well, of course. Um, but yeah, if you're working on type or design or something creative, hope it's going great. Hope you have a great day. Thanks so much for watching.